Hello. Thank you for joining us here at the Greenbrier Church Online. A friend of mine was telling me a story a few weeks ago about his four-year-old granddaughter. She was learning how to tie her shoes and having a little bit of difficulty mastering the art of being a shoe tire. Her mom and dad had tried all of the different methods to teach her how to tie her own shoes. They had done the two-loop approach, or they had done the the take-the-bunny-through-the-hole approach, and finally, she was beginning to get the hang of it. So her dad FaceTimed the grandparents so that their little girl could show off the new skill. So my friend and his wife are sitting 12 hours away watching their daughter, their granddaughter, on their cell phone, and she tied a knot. He said that they were so proud of her, they began to clap and to cheer for her and to be as excited as you could through FaceTime, and yet the little girl began to cry. Tears just started flowing down her face, and everybody was caught off guard. So my friend said that her dad picked her up and said, Sweetie, what's going on? And the little girl was crying. She said, I just learned how to tie my shoes. And the dad said, I know, baby. Isn't that wonderful? So why are you crying? And the little girl said, Well, because now I have to do it all by myself for the rest of my life. I think my friend's granddaughter is experiencing something that a lot of us have experienced in this life. You know, there are times when we have this expectation that something's going to happen and we will find joy or excitement. We'll be able to enjoy an event or an occasion and that feeling never really comes. Instead of feeling happy, we feel dread. and Maybe that's kind of what you're feeling right now. I know the song says it's the most wonderful time of the year, but what happens when it doesn't feel very wonderful? That's why this season I chose to use a Robert Earl Keene song, Merry Christmas from the Family, as our jumping off place to talk about some of our common experiences. There's a line in the song where he mentions that Fran and Rita drive up from Harlingen kind of unexpected, and nobody's really sure how they fit into the family dynamic. And when they show up, they just kind of take things over and things get a little sideways. But they're here. And now we're trying to figure out how do we move forward. It sounds like just another in a long line of Christmas struggles. Something that I think we all can understand. You see, this morning I want us to be honest. And I want us to acknowledge that for a lot of us, Christmas is actually a time of discouragement. So many of us get overwhelmed and it's easy to struggle and to get excited about the holidays or to find joy in this season. Maybe you're overwhelmed with financial difficulties or maybe you're having family issues or problems at work or maybe the thought of going to the store just to pick up a loaf of bread puts you in a panic attack. Whatever's going on, you know deep down that your Christmas will never look like those images you see on social media. You're never going to have the perfect table filled with family and food. You'll never have the perfect tree filled with lots of presents wrapped in big, beautiful bows. There's not going to be any pictures of you and your family on social media with the hashtag, best Christmas ever. No matter how much you want or how much you desire to be happy, it's easy for discouragement to just kind of slip up on us. In a time when it seems like everyone else is happy, everyone is enjoying family and friends and being together, we struggle with discouragement because our experiences don't live up to our expectations. When the picture that we have in our mind doesn't match our reality, when things don't happen the way that we hope or think that they should or the way that we've prayed that they would all work out. And that's the moment that we begin our battle with discouragement. It's it's easy to allow discouragement to grow into despair, especially during this time of the year. Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14, that the human spirit can endure a long illness, but who can survive a discouraged or crushed spirit? And that passage seems to be even more important during a season when our holiday spirit falls flat. So while Christmas might be a time for peace on earth and goodwill towards men, we discover that for most of us, it just it doesn't live up to that expectation. 
And what's worse is we get to the point where we realize that we have no control over our own experiences. So today I want us to look at an Old Testament story. And I believe it's a story that we're all familiar with. And not because we've read it a hundred times. I think we're familiar because it resonates. It seems mankind has always fought against discouragement and despair. The truth is when you hurt, you hurt. And it doesn't matter if it's Christmas or not. So during the holiday season, when some of us struggle to be positive, we need this story that begins in 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a man named Elkaniah who lived in Ramah. Elkaniah had two wives, Hannah and Paniah. Paniah had children, but Hannah did not. I'm going to go ahead and confess that there are times when stress comes from inside our own houses. Hannah is living in a less than ideal situation. She has a husband who also has another wife. It appears that they're all living in one house together. He has two wives, two families under the same roof. It's not like he spends Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and every other Saturday at one house, and then Tuesday, Thursday, and every other Saturday at the other house. All these people are are crammed into one house together under one roof, probably living in one room. Not only are there two families in a house, it seems that Elkaniah was married to Hannah first. Eugene Peterson translates this passage that Hannah was the first, the second was Paniah. Understand, this is not the life that Hannah had imagined as a little girl. This is not the picture that she grew up with in her mind. She... She never imagined that one day a man would come in and sweep her off her feet, that they would fall in love and get married and set up that that nice little house with a white picket fence, and then he would bring in a second wife. I mean, I'm sure she had dreams of starting and raising a family. She longed to be able to meet with the other mothers down in the marketplace. She longed to hear her son or her daughter quote the parts of the Torah that they learned in the synagogue. But her reality was so much different than what she'd imagined. And it's even worse than that. If we read out of the text, we see that it's not just another woman that's been brought into this marriage. There's a reason why she was brought into the marriage. The text says that Paniah had children, but Hannah didn't. I understand that we live in a different time and in a completely different culture. And I know... Sometimes today a woman or or couples make the choice that they don't want to have children. I have friends who made the decision before they got married that they're not going to have kids so that they could focus on their career or their hobbies or their relationships. But it's not always been that way. There was a time when your ability to raise children was tied to your standing in the community and your your reputation. Infertility was seen as a curse, especially in a culture where a woman's identity and purpose was tied to her ability to have kids. Every day, Hannah felt the weight of not being able to have children. She felt the judgment of not being able to start a family. It was actually seen as an indictment against her moral character or her standing with God. People all over town would whisper and gossip about the things that she must have done to get the punishment of God. They would have imagined her moral shortcomings, her failures, that would have caused God to discipline her like this. I want you to listen very closely to what I'm about to say. Because this is true in all types of circumstances. Discouragement is always trying to convince you that God is against you. Discouragement wants you to believe that this runs so much deeper than your circumstances, that it's actually the fact that God is not on your side. There's a whisper that God doesn't like you, that He can't love you, that you've offended God in some way, and now you're experiencing just a small part of His anger for your misdeeds, and pretty soon you're going to have to face the full weight of His wrath. Discouragement is always trying to convince you that God is against you. And that's not true. That's just a lie that's being whispered in your ear from the father of all lies. The truth is that God is for you. 
Paul reminds us in Romans 8 that God is on our side. He's working on our behalf for our good. He's proved his kindness and called us to be a part of his family as his sons and his daughters. God has already paid the price for our sins so that we can come to him. So while our current situation might not live up to this picture we have in our mind, that doesn't mean that God's punishing us. Actually, God might be preparing us for something greater when we get on the other side of this storm. Hannah's going through her storm. She's just not through it yet. We discover her husband goes out, brings another woman into the house. And that likely happened when Elkaniah discovered that Hannah is not able to give him children. And so it can't be his fault, it has to be hers. So he goes out and finds another wife. And the text says that Paniah, the second wife, is able to have kids, which just adds to Hannah's pain and discouragement. It adds to her despair. Somebody in her own home, somebody close to her, somebody she loved and trust, trusted, made a selfish decision. And that just compounded, compounded her desperation. Despair has a way of snowballing. Bringing in a second wife into the house doesn't make things better. It just makes it worse. Continuing in verse 3, each year Elkaniah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's armies at the tabernacle. On the days Elkaniah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Paniah and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would only give her one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Paniah would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Each year, Elkaniah would gather up his family and they would go on a 20-mile trip to Shiloh so that they could worship in the tabernacle. It's supposed to be a time of celebration, a time when the families get together, they worship God, they offer sacrifices, they share a meal around the table. It's a time of jubilation. Now, it might not have been a family gathered around the table for Christmas, but this was a time of celebration, a time of family, time of togetherness. And yet Hannah didn't feel like celebrating with her family. When I read this text, there's a part of me that really wants Hannah to stand up for herself, and I'm rooting for her to say something and put Paniah in her place. After all, Hannah was Elkaniah's first love. She has a place of position, of authority in the home. There's no reason for her to endure the bullying, but in her discouragement, she, she begins to feel like she deserves this. She's constantly being told this is her fault. She did something to bring all of this on herself. And it's not a one-time thing. We're told in verse 7 that it happens year after year. Not day after day, not week after week, not month after month. This has gone on for years. And so her feelings of discouragement are just reinforced over and over and over again which is exactly how we become mired in discouragement. Disappointment plus time equals discouragement. I mean, we can deal with disappointment. We can deal with it if something doesn't work out the way that we hoped, if we suffer a little setback or a little difficulty, as long as it's over, it's over a short period of time. But what happens when it happens time and time again over a long time? Our spirits get crushed. And it's hard to survive. And the story gets worse. The man who she loved, the one she hoped to grow old with in the company of her own family and children, had not only brought another woman into their home, had not only lived out her dream with another woman, he just piles on the discouragement because in verse 8 we read, Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkaniah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having ten sons? The short answer to that question is no. I mean, being married to a man who would bring another woman into the house and allow her to belittle you and talk trash to you is not better than having ten sons. 
I do want to take a step back, though, and admit that I understand what he's doing. Elkaniah is well-intentioned. He's trying to comfort and to reassure the woman that he loves, but his words, they come across as more of an indictment than a blessing. I mean, he's trying to minimize her pain and her hurt. He's taking something that is a huge deal in her life and saying, just get over it. It's not that big a deal. He's trying to force her to feel differently. And we can't force the way that we feel. I learned pretty early in my life that I can make you cry, but I can't make you sad. I can make you laugh, but I can't make you happy. I can sin against you. I can treat you without love, but I can't make you angry. We can force actions. We can't force feelings, no matter how hard we try. There's nothing more discouraging than somebody who's close to you telling you, you don't have any right to feel that way. You have no right to feel discouraged. Telling somebody not to be sad doesn't work. It never has. Elkaniah adds to her discouragement and her pain. Not only does he say, stop crying, but he has the audacity to say, you know, after all, you have me, and I'm better than ten sons, right? In other words, he's saying, Hannah, look at me. I am the solution to every problem that you have in your life. You won the husband lottery. Every woman in town is jealous because you have me, and I should be more than enough. What more could you want? That's a very arrogant and misguided thing to say. It's not that he doesn't mean well. He just chose his words poorly, which adds to her discouragement and her disappointment. So what do you do when you feel discouraged and you feel defeated? Remember, we have a memory verse this month. We are offered a way to battle the dysfunction, the stress, and the discouragement of the holiday season if we'll just follow Hebrews 12, 2 that says, Now stay focused on Jesus who designed and perfected our faith. And we find that's just what Hannah does. We go back to the text and we read in verse 9 that Hannah got up and went to pray. In the middle of her discouragement, she gets up and she goes to pray, which is a pretty difficult thing to do if we're just being honest. I mean, she's sitting at the table with Elkaniah, Paniah, and their horde of kids, and she gets up and she goes to God. God's the only one who can help us find peace in the midst of our our discouragement, but oftentimes that's the last thing that we feel like doing. When we're discouraged, we don't feel like getting up. We want to just kind of stay where we are. We want to wallow in our discouragement. We want to be the victim. We want to point a finger at everybody else and and say, you're not living up to our expectations. And yet Hannah shows us if we're going to manage our disappointment, we got to get up. We have to go to the one who loves us, the one who helps us bear our struggle and our burden. Hannah shows us the way that we deal with our discouragement is to fix our eyes on God and to surrender to Him. Surrender our plans, our expectations, our will. Jesus says it this way, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. I know following Jesus is easy when life is smooth. But getting close to him is imperative when we're dealing with depression, doubt, and discouragement. I'm not sure what you're facing today. I do know what it's like to be discouraged, and I know what it's like to struggle through the holidays. There have been times, even Christmas time, when I've been disappointed and discouraged because things didn't work out the way that I had hoped that they would, the ways that I prayed that they would. This morning, if that's where you find yourself, I want to encourage you to take a cue from Hannah. I want to encourage you to take advantage of the table, to get up and go to Jesus, the place where you can find your Savior and remember what He offers you today. This morning, I want you to take advantage of that time at the table, the place where we can come to admit that we can't do anything on our own. And yet we serve a God who can and wants to do everything for us in our lives. God has this this long history 
of taking care of his children, of loving his children, of walking with them through the storm, not taking the storm away from us, but allowing us to endure this time of discouragement and struggle. He walks with that through us because he wants to remind us that our life begins and ends in his presence. And if we can begin and end with him, then we can endure and thrive even in the disappointment and the discouragement of the holiday season. I really and truly hope that you have a wonderful time with your family over the next couple weeks. I've been praying that, that everybody who watches these videos online are able to have discussions that will bring joy and peace and love and growth into their lives. I pray that you will come to a deeper relationship with Jesus and understand that His love for you is greater than your struggle. I hope you have a wonderful time around the table. I hope that you have a blessed holiday season and that you never forget how deeply you're loved. I look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. I hope that you have a blessed day.